Hi, everyone. My name is Callie. Thank you so much for joining us. And I'm so excited to host this panel for you guys today. To sh quickly share a little bit about myself, I'm the co-founder of an amazing beauty tech startup called EXO Los Angeles Beauty, or EXO for short. We're centralizing the beauty experience for Black women and launching our platform before the end of this year. You guys can follow us at XOLA Beauty on Instagram, where we share daily beauty tips, trends, featuring your favorite brands, our favorite brands, and up and coming companies you guys should definitely check out. I live in beautiful Southern California. I'd really love to know where you guys are from, so definitely drop it in the chat. Um, drop your name and location. And let's get into our lovely panelist. So first up, we have Shannon Aspen of Baby Trust. She is the creative director and co-founder of Baby Trust. Baby Trust's mission is to create modern hair tools rooted in legacy for women of color. Their first product is the Edge Styler. It was named the best edge control product by Vogue magazine in 2021. Baby Trust is designed and headquartered in New York City. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Next up, we have Sierra May. She is the CEO and founder of Rebundle. Rebundle has recently been featured in Teen Vogue and Allure. Rebundle is revolutionizing hair extensions with more comfort and less waste. They're headquartered in St. Louis, Missouri, and the Rebundle team handcrafts plant-based braiding hair that is non-toxic, biodegradable, and most importantly, itch-free. And finally, we have Jessica Houston of Beauty Bees. Jessica is the Vice President of Operations and Lead Esthetician of Beauty Bees. Beauty Bees is a modern beauty supply store that also has beauty services like hair braiding, facials, and, the, and facials, and they're located in North Hollywood. She's originally from Shreveport, Louisiana, and currently resides in LA. She has a 10-plus year career in retail customer service and a three-year career as a licensed esthetician. And she's very excited to help recreate the conversation around traditional beauty supply, customer service experience, and how beauty experiences are achieved as women and people of color. Hi, guys. So these are all of our lovely panelists. Hey, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. I just want to mention to you guys that if you want to see everyone talking at the same time, you guys should turn on gallery view. So that's just up in the top right corner. It's those little nine boxes. Um, so click that if you want to be able to see everyone talk at the same time. We recommend that. And there's also going to be a giveaway at the end of uh, the panel. We're all giving away different things. XOLA Beauty is giving away beauty products. Rebundle is giving away a bundle. Baby Trust is giving away a few of their edge stylers. And Beauty Bees is giving some edge control. So if you guys want to when definitely be super engaged in the chat and drop your questions and at the end i'm gonna pick whoever whoever was the most engaged i already see we have lots of lots of people in the chat so i love that we have some new york some chicago lots of la that's exciting okay so i'm gonna go over what sustainability is and what we're talking about today this definition is from mcgill university Sustainability means meeting our own needs without compromising the ability of future generations to be able to meet their needs. In addition to natural resources, we also need social and economic resources. Sustainability is not just environmentalism. So here are some relevant examples surrounding the beauty and personal care industry and the issues that our panelists are taking on today with their companies. There are 1 billion toothbrushes thrown away per year. And when things are thrown away, that means they're put in the landfill and they, there's nothing that can be done with them. 30 million pounds of hair are thrown away per year in the US alone. According to Zero Waste Week, more than 120 billion units of packaging are produced globally every year by the cosmetics industry, contributing to the loss of 18 million acres of forest annually. I wanna hear from you guys. What's your personal definition of sustainability? Drop it in the chat, let's see. Yeah, I'm really curious to hear some of y'all's answers because sustainability has such a wide umbrella of things it could be about, so. Yeah, well, I'll look out for your answers. Um, we're gonna get started with the panel questions. It's gonna be a super, sorry about that. It's gonna be a super, <laughs> 
A super simple um, panel. Basically, I'll ask them questions and then they're all going to engage. And if you guys have any input, please drop it in the chat. Thank you, Toby, for letting us know. Thank you, Jody. Awesome. So earlier I mentioned how the beauty industry produces more than 120 billion units of packaging globally. Only 9% of all plastic waste ever produced has been recycled and about 12% is incinerated and the rest, which is about 80%, ends up in landfills, dumps, or the natural environment. What are some ways that we can acknowledge that the industry isn't sustainable? Well, I'll start um, with Baby Trust. When we first got started, um, one thing that we, we spent a lot of time discussing is how a lot of products, a lot of hair tools in the beauty supply store niche within black hair are kind of made to be disposable. I mean, you can reuse it for as long as it'll work, but it's not, not something that you're going to take care of, that you're going to clean and want to reuse. Like a lot of it is kind of made to be thrown away. And we really, um, noticing that whole, like that's really at the ethos of how we got started. Yeah, I'm reading some of the comments in the in the chat and um, resonating a lot with me because there's a lot of things I was thinking about when I started my journey into sustainability and why I even started Rebundle. Um, so, uh, Shannon, to your point, I um, I knew that there was a lot of single use waste happening in the hair extensions industry, and I knew this because I was participating in it um, just by virtue of being a black woman who wore braids and continues to wear braids. Um, but the, the hair extension industry is very interesting because it's not a space where sustainability comes to mind um, first. It's usually like, you know, style, how it looks, how long you can wear it, how easy can I get it, and how cheap is the hair. And mm -hmm. when I really started to dig into um, the data on like how much of this stuff is produced per year, how much we, we think is produced and thrown away each year, um, where is it being made? How is it reaching in the, the U.S. and everywhere else? And then what happens to it afterwards? I was really petrified by just the, the gravity of like how much waste was being created. And I knew I did not want to participate in that anymore. And so the hair extensions industry, it's a, it's a, a real opportunity for um, this industry as well as others to take a look at the way that we have our relationship with these products and the waste that they create and create new opportunities to be better. Thank you. I'm, I love everything that everyone is saying, but for us as a retailer, it's completely different because our hands are tied with what we're able to sell in the store. So um, I saw Amber Lewis in the comments. She said that it's an absurd, an absurd amount of plastic use with every beauty product. And that is absolutely right. Everything that's pretty much in our store is made out of plastic. So when we're able to partner with brands like Baby Tris or Rebundle to sell things that are more environmentally conscious, then that's definitely a way that we wanna go. We also are an e-commerce store. So we have to be cognizant of how we're packaging um, the orders that we send out and making sure that we're not um, adding to the waste and all the things that aren't really good for our environment. That's a really good point, Jessica. We need more companies um, working sustainable, sub, uh, sorry, sustainably. So, yeah. Yeah, that is a great point. And I really like, um, let's see, Ikenna Maduo, she said, or they said, excuse me, probably minimalism, divestment from capitalism practices that really emphasize the use of materials, like being as minimal as, as we can um, in addition to reusing is, is a, I think, a big deal in the retail space too. Um, and I love that you guys are doing that, especially with shipping out a bunch of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Just having that minimal mindset um, really goes a long way. Many people will strive to live like a zero waste lifestyle. And I entertained it. I, I tried to do all the research and figure out like, how do you actually live like this? But it's not always accessible for everyone. It depends a lot on like your environment, um, the city that you live in, even how sustainable is your city, um, the building you live in. If you live in an apartment, how do you go about, you know, getting rid of your trash and, and being able to compost and things like that. So um, a another way to still try to uh, hold those values is to try to live minimally as possible, buying as little as possible and only what you need and buying from brands that are, you know, using as little resources as possible too. So it's not, it's not an easy thing to do. It definitely takes a, a commitment, but a lot of people are moving in this direction because it's necessary. 
You guys have great engagement going on in the chat. So thank you guys for that. <laughs> lots of lots of entries for the giveaway. Okay. Moving on. I'd love to know how um, these brands, Baby Trust, Rebundle, and Beauty Bees are contributing to, to, to sustainability and to educating consumers about sustainability. Well, again, like, you know, as far as like purchasing hair tools and products that are higher in quality that you're going to use for much longer and that you can even like once it's passed like once the bristles are like past being able to use them to lay your edges like you could still use the tool in other ways um that's a big way like with our product development and then also as far as social sustainability um we're really big on you know the education of the youth and making sure we're giving back to young people because they are going to be the ones who are carrying on the torch later so them having access to these products now when they're eight, 10 years old makes a huge difference, you know, later when they are, they're the ones creating these businesses and they're the ones educating the next round of children. So those are the two biggest ways I'd say Baby Trust is making an impact specifically as it pertains to black beauty and sustainability. Thanks. Yeah. I'm with that, um, Shannon. I started with education before we had a product, before we had a platform. I was just getting on Instagram talking about the things that I learned in this industry and the things that I was trying to do to be better in um, informing our community on um, what it looks like to you know, live sustainably with your hair, with your hair, wearing your hair in braids. So education is a big piece of our platform. Platform. You can go to our website. We have tons of information about our own products as well as what we know about plastics and dedic hair. Um, and that's just where we started. Now we have our own products, plant-based braiding hair, and we continue to provide education on like why you should try this as an alternative, why it is an alternative to plastic in the first place, um, how it should feel on your scalp. Like, being uncomfortable and itchy is not normal. And that has something to, to do with sustainability as well. Like it's not sustainable to buy a product that you know will irritate your scalp and you may take it out within days. That just adds mm -hmm. to the waste. So um, we, we carry these conversations and um, try to invite people into like thinking differently because these, these alternatives have to exist. We have to move forward in this way so that this waste doesn't continue um, to grow. Yeah, I think the biggest piece for us being a retailer is that we're able to have these conversations live in person. Um, we pride ourselves on our customer service and we love when customers like come in, they sit, they chat, they talk to us because we're really able to educate them on things that will actually work for their hair instead of buying something that they don't really know if it's going to work and then they're going to throw it away anyway. So we try to have those conversations, give them tips and tricks. And we also let them know like, hey, if it doesn't work, you use it once or twice and you're just like, I don't like this. We don't, you can't return it to us. We are so sorry, but you can <laughs> pass it along. <laughs> you can pass it along to like your sister. Like if my if I don't like something and I know that my hair just doesn't like it. My sister, her texture is a little bit different than mine. So I'll give it to her. And if she doesn't like it, I bring it to the store and I give it to the girls and I let them know like, hey, this didn't work. But it also gives them an idea of how to sell to customers too and let them know like, it's okay if it doesn't work, just don't automatically throw it, throw it away because it's a two-in-one. Now you're putting ingredients into the environment that are good for the environment. And you're also putting nine times out of 10, it's gonna be plastic. So that's going into the environment as well. So try to pass it along to someone else, bless someone else. And then if it just doesn't work for them, it doesn't work. Love that. That's really good. That's <laughs> really good. Something I've heard along the lines of that is if you have skincare products and it didn't work on your face and you don't love it, you can still use it on your body and not have to throw it away. So absolutely. Being an esthetician though, I would also <laughs> say too, ask an esthetician, like make sure that whatever you're using it's not hard it's not going to be harmful or wherever you're trying to use it on your body some areas are a little bit sensitive than others so that's all i'm gonna say there yes be careful yeah <laughs> drop any questions that you guys have in the chat for the panelists i know a question that i have is if um someone's just starting out with their sustainability journey where did you guys look for resources what did you find the most helpful i mean yeah i i'll I don't know if you're asked in the chat or asking us, but I'll just say like, I'm a huge Reddit fan. So like anything I 
have a question about, I go to Reddit. And I mean, I think it just starts within your community. Like if you think about what, the, like what's missing it within your community and just go from there. I mean, we can't, one person's not gonna change the world of course, but digging into what's around you and talking to the people around you is a great way to start. And then of course the internet. <laughs> the internet, yeah, I, I love <laughs> to do research. So I would spend hours just reading about um, the circular economy and this the plastic bubble like I just found it so fast and I used to watch there's a there's a video on uh, it was on prime and it was talking about how China was no longer accepting I think the US and a few other countries oh, plastic yes. and I was just like, like this is that. crazy like mm -hmm. where is this stuff going to go because the US was not taking care of it and it's just kind of uh, kind of just uh, spread from there, like looking into other resources. I found communities that were doing this type of research as well. There were studies online and I read everything I could find because I was just in love with the idea that we could be better if, you know, there's enough research out there and enough initiative to take these things and like do something with it. So yeah, Google is your friend. <laughs> Google is your friend. Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. You're good. I was just agreeing. Google research is your best bet on every front. Figuring out what's the best packaging material to use when you're shipping, which products are not harmful. So yes, research everything for sure. Um, in the q and A, I'm gonna I'm gonna answer one of these live. It looks like it's from Shonda O. She wants to know. It's a question for you, Sierra. She wants to know about your recycling program and the process to recycle the plastic extensions. Yeah, so again, when I first started, that was that is what I was focused on. Like, how do I do better with my plastic hair? And the reason we carried that program, the initiatives, because it, it was so near and dear to me and I knew that the industry was not gonna move as fast as we could um, to you know, sustainably dispose of plastic, plastic synthetic hair. We recently won an award this week that's gonna allow us to invest a little bit more in that program and to make it a little bit better. So as it stands, anyone from anywhere can mail us um, their used plastic hair and we only accept plastic. We don't accept our hair back. We don't accept hair on wefts um, or wig caps, but you can mail us your, your free plastic synthetic hair. Um, it can then be shredded, it's sorted by type of plastic and then reprocessed into new materials. So we have a partner who helps us move these products, move the, the hair waste um, along that supply chain and have machinery that can do all the shredding and, and repurposing. So it definitely is a labor of love. Uh, the material is a hard to recycle plastic, meaning there's no easy way to do it like a, a, a bottle of water, which is tried and true um, and something that I'm really passionate about and you know dedicating resources to our company to be able to continue to build that out because it's really important and people really find it um, important and love it about our brand as well. So yeah, you can you can't re you can't say anything right now. We're in the process of moving it, relocating the facility, but um, we should be back up and running very soon. I have a question for Rebundle. <laughs> so you don't take hair on um, on webs or wigs, but like, what if I have a synthetic wig and I cut it off of the tracks? People have asked that, and the problem with cutting hair off webs is if it's not a synthetic. Um, it's a human hair blend and typically human hair can be composted and we don't compost at the moment. So if it's mm. a synthetic wig, you feel free to cut it off that, that cap. Um, but we don't take human hair because it's a totally different process that we haven't you know, invested in um, as of yet. But it doesn't mean that we won't, we just can't do it right now. Absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that question, Shonda. We'll take some more questions later, but I'm gonna move on to our next uh, question. So as a new beauty founder, what can people do if they're just starting a company to make sure that their line or whatever they're releasing is sustainable? And what did you guys do to make sure that you were building sustainable brands? I love this question. <laughs> <laughs> Aside from starting with the research, I think that part of it is... Um, Oh, for me personally, this is about what we did. It was already, sustainability was already weaved into how I was thinking and how I moved about in the world. And so whenever I had to make a decision for the company, sustainability was always first. Packaging. I knew that I didn't want to sell our hair in the plastic sleeves that we're used to seeing hanging in beauty supply stores. I didn't want to contribute in, to plastic uh, pollution in that way. So we use reusable drawstring bags that people can uh, hold their hair in until they're ready to use it and they can repurpose them afterwards. Um, and, you know, just starting there, like you, you have to have this mindset that 
plastic is not always first. There are other alternatives. Uh, and if you think that way, you can begin um, finding more materials and more alternatives out there just by looking and, and knowing that you don't want to start with plastic first. I can piggyback off of um, what you just said. Um, so our, along with how we package um, orders to ship out, we also have reusable bags that we give our customers in store, uh, which is a super cute branded bag, but it's a very like sturdy bag. So it can also be reused outside of um, the store as well. So definitely figuring out ways for you. And in LA, we like, we can't, we have to pay for bags essentially. So it's like a double entendre. If you're coming into our store, you're getting a bag from us, but then you're going somewhere else and reusing it. Um, so when customers, it's like a subconscious thing, a mind trick on them, like, okay, well, you live in LA. So if you get a bag from us and you go to Target, you're going to also use this bag. Um, so figuring out ways to bring your consumers along with your journey of being sustainable when they're not even in your store is super important as well. Yeah, I, I would say for baby trust, it's, it's a little different. So like, you know, the bundle like came out the gate, like with the sustainability for us, in the very beginning, we were much more focused on the design of, of the product itself. And um, which I know we're going to get into like the, the financials a little later, but for us, like the packaging was like part of it. Like we were just like, we want to make sure the brush is like cushioned enough for like shipping and like it's going to be shipped a bunch of times. We want to make sure it's good for that. But we didn't think, you know, what if we come out with, we weren't thinking about like the material of the packaging. So now our packaging is plastic and, you know, now we have to like sell through the inventory that we do have so that we can innovate the packaging around the product that we already have. So now we're kind of like backtracking like, just a little bit. I think, you know, knowing what we know now, um, it's definitely much easier in the beginning to take your time um, to just think about, think about the, the future impacts of what you want to create and, you know, think about how it's going to live with the consumer. Like, you know, who's this person that you're creating it for? What's their actual lifestyle? What are they going to do with this box after they take the edge styler out? Like now it's just here, as opposed to like, perhaps we could have done a little baggie or something that they could reuse. Um, I'll just say, slow down and just think about what you want. And again, talk to your community um, so that you don't end up with, you know, thousands and thousands of units of inventory that is contributing to the plastic problem. Um, it's lessons learned, but the research and taking time to also source vendors too. I know that when we first started, because we were so like thinking about the design, like we wanted to like, we were excited to get it out into the market. And I think if we had just slowed down just a tiny bit, I mean, no regrets because things are great, but still like just slowing down a little bit sometimes makes all the difference and really consider like that can go in your business plan when you're first conceptualizing everything that you want to do like consider your social or excuse me your sustainability aspect um, as far as environmental and also social too like who are you collaborating with to make this project happen thank you shannon i think that was a really thoughtful answer and i think it really shows that there's always room for improvement and brands can always continue innovating just because it's one way doesn't mean it always has to be that way. So I think that's a really good point to highlight. You guys have some really good questions. So I'm going to ask a couple from the Q&A. There's a Q&A feature, by the way, if you want me to see your question directly. The first one is for Beauty Bees. How do you guys go about advocating for more sustainability practices in local beauty supply stores and in possibly even the brands that you guys are accepting in Beauty Bees? It all goes back to research and who's who's providing the most sustainable products as well. Um, we always want to make sure that we're not adding to the the issue. Um, so sometimes with the ingredients that are used in products, um, that could result into like a higher amount of what the price point is going to be in the store or how it's going to sell in the store. So we have to take all those um, factors into account to make sure that it'll work for us and the brand as well. That question was from Amber Lewis. So thank you. And thank you for answering that for her. Uh, this one's for Sierra and Shannon. You guys are direct to consumer. 
Um, how do you guys both take into consideration the sustainability efforts that vendors that you guys are selling to have? Mm. Shannon, you could probably That's take it. <laughs> That's a good question. Um, hmm. If you're talking about environmental sustainability, um, of course, that's as we're looking like at, we're in the in the process of product development now for some new things and from the jump like reaching out to vendors like we're specifically looking for certain materials and certain, you know, the things that will not contribute to the waste problem. It's really tricky because, you know, the, the more innovative packaging suppliers and the more innovative formula or excuse me chemists are way more expensive. And if we want to be accessible, if we want our products to, you know, reach the masses, it's almost like we have to compromise. Like which which thing kind of is more important because we don't have millions of dollars in investor funds. Um, we're bootstrapped. So it's tricky. Um, but when we're recent, when we're looking for these vendors, like that's the first thing we're asking about. And we're talking to our community to see who they know, like that's that's like the best way to go about it. Thank you from that, for that. That question was from Chanel Lake. So thank you, Chanel. We're gonna move on to our next panel question and then we can answer some more. You guys are submitting really great questions and I even see some more I wanna get to. So thank you for that. So oftentimes products that are sourced and produced sustainably are more expensive. Why is that? And why should consumers spend the extra money? I can start <laughs> because our price point is obviously higher than all of our competitors, but with good reason. So um, on average, a pack of plastic synthetic hair is five to six dollars. And I look at this two ways. I consider the, the hair extensions industry to be like fast fashion, meaning these mm -hmm. products are made within seconds um, with millions of SKUs and millions of, uh, of pounds of these products made per day. And that is, that is not who we are. We've also just launched this year. And so there's some level setting and expectations that we have to share with our, our community and our customers. Um, but we're not a fast fashion brand, meaning we have real people who make real money to make our products by hand for the most part. Um, we sourced our materials carefully. We source our packaging carefully. And we also invite you in, onto a, an experience um, to an experience of plant-based braiding hair for the very first time. So our price point reflects like where the market is headed, the value add that we have for you as a consumer and the industry overall, as well as education on like why you should be making this switch. So um, it, it's something that we get asked uh, every now and then, but we also have seen that people are understanding that you pay for better. Sometimes you just pay for better. Um, and you, and if you want better, you're, you're willing to make that switch. Um, but it doesn't mean that, you know, we want our products to be not accessible to others, but we also understand that where we are today and the size of our company and, and being new, um, that it may seem inaccessible to some, but, you know, we're, we've set that price point for a reason and, and invite you to, um, you know, join the community and take part in like why you should want better. Toby had a really thoughtful, Toby Shannon had a really thoughtful uh, input that I really like. She said the sustainability is affordable over time because when you can reuse the products over and over, then it's not as expensive. So thank you for that, yeah. Toby. Yeah, totally there's a really saying that. that the cheap pay twice. <laughs> so yeah, and that's true in some cases. Um, not saying it's necessarily true for us, but it's true in some cases. Yeah definitely the cost for wear over time. If you're buying quality things that last for longer will absolutely even out. Um, I have some like, as far as like why sustainable products are more expensive, I have some like numbers that we've been working on um, for Baby Chess. So um, we're working on a new product. I won't say what it is, but I guess it might be kind of obvious to guess. But what we were thinking was, how, is there a way to create this product and have reusable packaging? Like, is there a way to like, Maybe your first purchase is like a really pretty glass jar and then there's like a, you can pull it out and then we can just ship you, you know, so you keep the same jar. But that product doesn't really exist, right? So now we have to innovate something new, which already is way more expensive than just buying what's available. 
So, you know, currently in order to create this brand new packaging, just to create the mold itself is like upwards of like $40,000, right? That's just the mold. That doesn't include like minimum order quantities or the cost of the formula that we're putting in it or the cost to ship it. Like that's just, just the mold to try something new. And the cost of innovation is, is very high. So for a startup, again, you know, like I said before, like then it comes, you have to compromise on things. Like maybe the packaging can exactly be reusable, but it can be glass. And then, you know, after you're done with the product that's in it, then you can put a plant in it or something, which I, I love seeing people do that. Um, so yeah, it's just the, the cost of things are very high. And then it also depends on where you're producing it too. Um, we did decide to produce overseas because we wanted to keep our, our product at a certain price point. But if you want to produce in America like, or, or any, even closer, if you want to produce somewhere closer, like that's also an added fee. Um, and it really, it really is, it would have to be the businesses making the shift. You know, I think the more these businesses are looking for these products and the more these B2B businesses will have them available. And then also it's the consumers demanding those products and only purchasing them because um, money talks. So I hope that answers the question. <laughs> Thank you, I guys. Think as, a, as a retailer, we see it more so in the ingredients that are used in the packaging, packaging that the product comes in. So if you have a product that is more organic or it has more biodegradable ingredients in it, then it's going to be a more expensive product, which also like Shannon said, money does talk. So they actually do sell better and quicker than a product that's one gonna contribute to the amount of waste and is also not gonna do what it needs to do for your hair. So we do see an increase in the amount, the price of orders that we have to make with those more sustainable products, but it's like on the back end, like, do I go ahead and bite that bullet and I know my customers are going to want that product specific, specifically, or do I get this other lower end product and it might just sit on our shelf? So it's, it's kind of a balancing act to figure out which products are going to be more environmentally friendly and work for your hair and not contribute to the waste problem, or is it just going to sit on our shelves shelf and collect dust? So. Savannah had um, a really good question that I liked. She wanted to know when you're looking for sustainable beauty products, is there some sort of seal that people can be looking for or any way to decipher if a product is actually sustainable? Are we at that point yet? That's a good question. Um, a sustainability seal. I guess there's some differences. If we're talking clean beauty, which uh, is specific to ingredients, the uh, there's a there's a leaping bunny um mm -hmm. and then the uh, pita which we have um as well for like vegan um so those are some that that may work um and then i believe no issue has their own for their packaging i'm not sure if it's like a uh nationwide or i think i also think they're a canadian company so i don't know if there's like a a worldwide symbol for uh, sustainability in terms of like materials being used, like packaging. Um, those are those are the ones that I'm aware of. I know yeah, there's I an app called Think Dirty that you guys can check on. It kind of is more on clean beauty and not, but it does have all of the classifications of a product on there. So that could be somewhere you could start, Savannah. I think it also helps to um, if you if you're looking at a product and specific product that you're interested in, like go to their website. I think if they're transparent they're gonna tell you what their social um, mission is. They're gonna tell you what their products are made out of. Um, yeah, just go to their website. If you don't find it anywhere, if it takes like forever to like search for these things, then maybe that's the sign. Yeah, it's it's typically not something that companies hide. It's usually a, a source of pride and like value prop of the brand um, to be operating sustainably. So. Yeah, to, to Shannon's point, look it up on their website or even their Instagram too. They might have it all over there. Yeah. Toby has another question. 
for all of the panelists. Do any of you guys work in advocacy or policy surrounding beauty, uh, the beauty products that you work with? And have you thought about lobbying to push for more sustainable products? Great question. question. And yeah. I, I know Toby, and that's why I'm, I'm laughing. Um, yeah, when I first started Rebundo, I thought that was the route I was gonna take. I thought I was gonna be on TV, like blasting <laughs> brands and on the, at courthouses, like making cases as to why not only plastic synthetic hair was toxic to, to women and the people who used them, um, but also the environment. And so there was a, a program that I got involved with called the Commission for Environmental Cooperation, where I actually got to speak to the director of um, the EPA at the time. And so, yes, there was a time when I thought that was gonna be my life. Um, ultimately, it's still part of the work that I do, but I decided that the best type of advocacy is through product development. And so I can push these products and push consumers to, to swing this way. Um, and overall, the, the industry will have to catch up because the consumer will force them to. So yeah, that's that. That's my stance on it. <laughs> For Baby Trust, we don't work with um, like specific advocacy policy around beauty products. Um, more of our social mission is about education um, with, young, with young kids, young girls, um, like entrepreneurial initiatives. Um, and I agree with what Sierra is saying, like product development is like a really good way to, to advocate for those things as opposed, or not as opposed to, but like in conjunction with the people who do use their voice to speak about them as well. Yeah, I agree with both Sierra and Shannon. It's literally all about the conversation and the education around how we are as consumers. So being a retail space, like we are able to change the narrative of what it actually looks like to, what you experience when you go into a beauty supply, you aren't getting educated on the proper tools or the proper products to use for your hair. So changing the behaviors around what the mind has thought was the right way for so many years when it comes to a beauty supply or a retail, a beauty retailer, we're trying to change that, that narrative around the beauty space. And even to add to that, like, um, a lot of us work alongside some of these advocates and people doing really good work on the policy side. So we're able to amplify their voices. And likewise, they're telling their audiences about our products and we're telling our audience about the work that they're doing and how much it all matters and how much we're working together. So we all don't have to be, you know, one thing. We don't have to do all the work because there's people who are better at some things than others. So I'm good at running a business and someone else is better at <laughs> um, infiltrating change. <laughs> Those are really great answers. Thank you for that. And thank you for the question, Toby. I see another question that I wanna ask, and this is from Jody Chin. Um, and I wanna ask it for Sierra. She asked, why aren't more companies working with TerraCycle? What's it like being a small business and trying to work with a company like TerraCycle? Yeah, TerraCycle does great work. They're also really expensive, <laughs> which speaks to the point that we made earlier. And so it can be, inaccessible for small um, small brands to work with them. And I know this because I tried to take that route as well. Um, from what I understand about how they operate is their, their real value prop that they, that they offer is to like large brands who are putting out millions upon millions of products per year. Um, and they can help them to facilitate that recycling process of their, their goods. For a smaller company like all of ours, I would say we're all technically small businesses. Um, it's a lot harder to work with them um, just because of, you know, what their, where their threshold is. So fortunately, there's other uh, companies that are coming up, popping up that are doing that work on a smaller scale. And it's a lot more accessible uh, to small companies. And then also, like, you have the opportunity to develop your own, like, our recycling program for plastic, plastic synthetic hair. We're not able to work with TerraCycle, but we were able to figure out how to facilitate that work on a smaller scale. We've only collected a couple hundred pounds. I have no idea how much they've collected, but you know, there's millions of pounds out there and we're starting here because it's accessible to us. Thank you for that question, Jody, and thank you for your answer, Sierra. We'll do more questions in a minute, but I'm gonna move on to one of our final panel questions. So a lot of times people aren't living sustainably because they really don't know how to and they don't know anything different. And there's also a huge lack of access that we should acknowledge as well. How can consumers be more sustainable and how can they get that education uh, to, to do better and be more sustainable? 
this goes back into um, someone in the chat mentioned about like cost per wear going down over time. It gets cheaper over time. Like it really starts with what you're buying in the beginning. So like, you know, in beauty, like, okay, so you could buy a toothbrush and lay your edges with your toothbrush. You're probably not going to clean it or care for it or whatever. And then you're going to throw it away and then you're going to get another $1 toothbrush and just, you know, it keeps going on and on like that versus, you know, taking time to find a tool that meets your needs, meets your needs well, that you want to keep, that you want to clean, that you want to use all the time. Maybe you buy, maybe you have one or two just for different things, but like ultimately you're keeping the same products. I mean, you can, it's a whole consumer mindset shift um, in how we just consume things, even like something as simple as like drinking water, right? Like a lot of people use plastic water bottles. You could also get, you know, like a, a stainless steel $30 one. And some people may be like, well, $30, I don't want to spend that on a water bottle, but I bought this water bottle however long ago. And now like, I don't have to spend that dollar every day or whatever. Um, so putting in that investment in the beginning, I think is a good way to start on a sustainability journey. Yeah, good points there. I also think that um, there are these communities and like influencers that are coming up in the sustainability space that is so brilliant because it, it brings it down to a level that is consumable um, and also really relatable. They're usually like younger people sharing information with, sharing information to everyone, but the communities that they've built are like very specific to Gen Z, to millennials and trying to like, trying to get us to understand that it's going to be on us to make these changes going forward. Um, so on top of my head would be like Leah Thomas, the uh, intersection environmentalist community, um, the black girl environmentalist community at most shares some of this knowledge. Humankind shares a lot of this through their products and additional information. Um, Climate Diva, there's, there's so many people and you find one and you probably find the rest of them because they're a, a tight knit community. But um, the information that they share is really valuable and it's, it's a step in the right direction to start engaging with them and absorbing what it is that they have to say. Is that on me? Um, I think as a beauty provider, um, I were taught in school to tell our clients to come see us every three to four weeks. But realistically, I'm a realist. I'm going to have a conversation with you while you're getting your service done. If you don't need to come back to see me every three to four weeks to save the amount of tools that I have to use that sometimes aren't able to be environmentally friendly, then that kind of lengthens the time in between um, your services. So instead of saying come back every three to four weeks, I try to stretch it out every five to six weeks so that we're making sure to like keep you on a treatment plan, but it's also minimizing our footprint in, in the environment. Those are all really great answers. And I think you guys, anyone who came to this panel today is already a step in the right direction. If you see something and you're attending it and you bring a friend, um, you guys are all doing great. Lorena has a really great question, Lorena James. She says, in her experience with sustainable education, workshops seem to be a great method to educate people about products and sustainable living. Have you guys seen a lot of interest in this with your workshops, um, especially during COVID? Or do you find you're having to pull people in? I mean, this is the first um, discussion that we've had, like a, a round table or like a, you know, more than myself and one other person on live. I think that people are either coming to our, our brand for a product or for education or, or both. Maybe they find one, they come for one and they find uh, another. So I don't think that it's been a um, more of a challenge for us to build community around sustainability because we've made it very clear that's who we are and that's what we stand for. Um, but it doesn't mean that there aren't better ways to invite people in to like absorb this type of information. I also don't think that people, like when it comes to um, like hair products, I don't think that people right now are thinking about if I don't like this product, what can I do with it besides just throw it away? So having the conversation around something as simple as giving it to someone else, you might not think about it and you might just let it sit under your cabinet for a while and then you do a purge and then you just throw it all away. But if we're having those conversations while customers are in the store, then we're able to like get it on their mind so that they feel like they have another option than to just throw it away. 
Thank you for the question, Lorena. Beauty bees, we actually had a follow-up question that kind of goes to what you just said. Angel asked, as a part of sustainability and using less, does it concern you that you're asking people um, to, if they don't like a product, to give it to someone else? Does it concern you that you're going to be getting less sales? No, I think our customers appreciate the fact that we're honest with them. Um, every when you're going, when you're being a customer, you want a real conversation. Um, so I think that by having that conversation, it's only going to make them trust us a little bit more. That if they didn't like it, we were able to give them some type of advice um, to be able to trust us a little bit more to come back in. So I don't think that it it contributes to them not wanting to come back in the store. They actually kind of respect us a little bit more. I really agree with that as a consumer. I really like when I go in a store and have an experience like that, it will make me want to come back. So great answer. This is an anonymous question. Um, do you guys have any advice for people wanting to launch a sustainable company? They want to know if you know of any good vendors or suppliers to look at in terms of manufacturing. That's a good question. It really depends on what you're making mm -hmm. to start there. Um, but I think the low hanging fruit for like making sustainable products more accessible is packaging. There's a lot of resources out there for packaging. There are several companies that are um, trying to acknowledge the amount of waste that comes from beauty packaging alone. Um, so like no issue that I mentioned earlier, um, Eco and Clothes is another one that I'm aware of. Those are the two on the top of my head. It, it really depends on what, what you're making. Though. I'm not sure if there's like a one size fits all uh, vendor or manufacturer who can make any and everything sustainably. Um, but starting to do the research on like what it is you want to start and who's already in this space thinking the way that you are uh, about uh, sustainability. That's great. Irene has a follow up to that. When you are looking for a manufacturer, vendor, supplier, whatever, um, how are you, what are you categorizing as a sustainable partner to work with? Is it because they're paying their employees well? Is it, what are you guys looking for to claim that they're sustainable? Yeah. yeah, I mean, ideally, we could be manufacturing here in the US where we could, you know, get a better insight into who's actually working there. And then we're also looking at materials too, um, particularly with our next product, like glass or aluminum or something other than just plastic. Those are like the two main things we're looking for. So that and they then, have options for you guys to pick from. Yeah. Options is good. I think that sometimes brands don't lead with the sustainable work that they're doing, it's some, especially if they're like an older company, meaning they've been doing this work for, for decades on decades and know exactly what they're doing. They don't always lead with that, but you can ask them like, what are your sustainability goals as a company? And how does that show up in um, my relationship with you as a, as a vendor? Sometimes it just takes asking them what it is that they're doing in order for them to share. Awesome. So I think we have time for one more question. Thank you for that question, Irene. This question is from Amber Lewis. She wants to know, um, do you guys have any other sustainable beauty brands that you want to shout out? What are some other brands that have um, good sustainable products? Sounds like a swap question to me. I have lots of swaps that I've made. <laughs> some of my favorite swaps um, include Last Swab. I got that as a gift not too long ago. Love that. I love my Ruby Loves. I have a few pair of those as well as Hestas to go along with that. Um, I swapped out my, I don't use cotton swabs. I use cotton rounds that I can wash. Um, what else? Those are the ones off the top of my head. Those are some of my favorites. And I also use I products in glass jars as much as I can. One of my favorite brands is Base Butter, and I, I love their glass product. Jars. They they use glass jars too, and then they also have these like washcloths, like reusable um, face wash cloths that I really like. I just got that in Beauty Bees, by the way. It is in stock <laughs> in Beauty Bees. Plug. <laughs> Amazing. I also use bamboo bamboo sponges. That's another one that I like. Nice. XOLA Beauty actually just posted this morning a bunch of beauty swaps. So definitely check out. And a lot of the ones that they mentioned are on there. So if you guys want to 
see the last swab or a good brand for cotton swabs, check that out. So we're gonna take a second to pick the giveaway winner as we close out. So just a moment for that. Oh, soft services, that's a good one. Someone mentioned. I'm curious what brands you guys know of too, if you guys could drop that in the chat. Yeah, I'm always looking for good swaps. So let me know what you guys have. Otta B is a good um, nail polish. They're vegan nail polish and love scrubs. If you like um, like exfoliators, yes. the best exfoliate, like cut it so in good. fours and you can <laughs> reuse it. It's literally the best thing ever. Wait, what's it called? Love scrub. Love scrub. It's like a, it's like a mesh long a of, like scrub. It's like net and it's washable. It's reusable. Like when I tell ex my clients to exfoliate, I tell them to use that along with whatever exfoliator that they like to use if they need a double. But yeah, I cut mine so that I had, it's not like I'm a very small human. So I cut it so that it's, it's literally taller than me when it's wet. So I just cut it so that I'm able to manage it in the shower. Interesting. Oh, so I you can use it. this in place, in place of like a, 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 a loofah. Product. Okay. A loofah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I see some people in the chat shouting out black and green. It's like a marketplace. Um, mm -hmm. That's, that's a really good resource as well. Tara, Tara. Someone said the ordinary brand that is a really good brand and is very effective for skincare as well. And is very afford affordable too. Yeah, I love their glass containers. I always try to, I mean, mm -hmm. they're small, but I like to reuse them too for oils and stuff. Yeah, yeah. we're mentioning a lot of products I really love. Okay, so I've selected a winner. It was hard because I see a lot of engagement, <laughs> but Irene Edwards, you were really engaged and you asked a few really thoughtful questions. So thank you for that. And thank you everyone for all the thoughtful questions. Amazing. Um, Sierra's gonna see if she can get your information really quickly. Yeah, there were a lot of really good questions that we didn't even get to. You guys want to answer any really quickly? Let's see. There was one. Um, Josh Alvarez asked, um, let me find it. He was like, how do you negotiate the terms of sustainability with profitability? That's a really great question. I mean, I think I kind of touched on this before. It's kind of like a dance. It's like sourcing the vendors, but sourcing the vendors that have the right MOQs and then how much are we going to sell it for like talking to our consumers and knowing our consumers and knowing how much you know they'd be willing to you know we want to be true to them as well um the negotiation is really just you know it's a song and dance and taking your time <laughs> to find what's going to fit our needs what's going to fit our consumers needs too yeah I have Irene's email. Thank you, Irene. Awesome. Okay, well, I think that is everything. Thank you guys so much. Do you guys have any closing statements? I just thank everyone for coming. Like we really pulled this out sort of last minute. Was, I think it was a great success. And thank you all so much for your, for your questions and for engaging with us and um, if you want to follow more Baby Trust, you can follow us on Instagram or shop Baby Trust um, and also babytrust.com. And that's it for me. Yeah. Thank you guys for coming. I hope that you were able to take away at least some starting points for continuing or beginning your sustainability journey. And of course, follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Rebundle Co. Yeah, guys, thank you so much for joining us today. This was great. Thank you for the question, super thoughtful. It made me think as a consumer too, not only as someone who sells them, but someone who buys them. Um, so if you guys wanna come see me at the store, I'm always here. I can have a great conversation with you. <laughs> or you can follow us at Beauty Bees store on Instagram or visit us at beautybees.com if you're not in LA and you can order from us. So yeah. Well, thank you guys. You can follow us at XOLA Beauty. You guys had really thoughtful questions and I think the best thing any of you guys can do is share what you learned today with a friend and pull them into sustainability with you. So bye everyone. Bye. Bye.